Oh, hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I'm Liv, your favorite mythology-obsessed lunatic. As I mentioned last week, we're taking a brief pause in the brilliance that is the Odyssey so that we can use this wonderful Pride Month that is June to focus on some lesser-known stories that feature queer characters of Greek mythology. These stories are, tragically, quite rare, and when they do exist, they're often told in ways that negate some of the pride that might otherwise be found. But I'm going to try to cover these stories today in a way that highlights the ultimately LGBTQ undertones, rather than the patriarchal lens they're told through. Because we know how I feel about the patriarchy, and if you don't, I mean, honestly, how did you get here? Today's episode will cover two stories, both of which you all have asked about at least a couple of times, though these ones far less than Apollo and Hyacinth. So I'm hoping this is brand new information for many of you, it's just more fun that way. Both stories, primarily, come from my beloved, dear Ovid. Elsewhere, their stories are brief and not at all the way they could be, so I'm sticking with Ovid, and with that comes, as you guessed it, the Roman names. I'll point them out to you and tell you the Greek equivalents, but we're going with Roman for the most part. And so, I give you... Episode 52. Jupiter and Neptune ruin everything! The stories of Canis and Callisto. Our first story begins after the tragic story of Phaethon and Helios' chariot ended. The earth is scorched from Phaethon's crash of the sun chariot, and Jupiter, Zeus, is surveying the damage done. As he examines the earth, putting out fires as he finds them, he pays special attention to Arcadia, the region of ancient Greece that makes up the center of the Peloponnese, and Jupiter's favorite region. There he spots, yes, you guessed it, a woman. Weird, I know, something new and different for our favorite pervy old man god. Yes, he spots a woman, a nymph. Not only a nymph, but a devotee and hunting partner of Diana, Artemis, goddess of the hunt and proud, badass virgin. The nymph's name is Callisto. Jupiter spots Callisto, and as he is wont to do, he immediately determines that he absolutely must fuck her and that there is no alternative to his having sex with this woman regardless of how she feels about it because he is Jupiter. It is his right. He is king of the gods. There's just something, something different about Callisto to Jupiter. She doesn't behave like the other women, nor does she dress like them. She doesn't worry about how she looks or how pretty her hair is. Her clothes are simple, almost masculine in their simplicity. Her hair is tied back in a practical way to keep it off her face. She's more concerned with hunting and racing and generally being cool. That, and she spends all of her time with the goddess Diana. The goddess Diana who's devoted herself to never being with a man, no matter what. A goddess that surrounds herself with tough, badass women. A goddess who, well, like I've said in the past, it's never overt that Diana, Artemis, prefers women to men, but at the same time it's pretty clear what's up with Diana's sexuality. Callisto, absolutely unaware that an incredibly creepy and invasive god has been watching her from afar, takes a break from the hot sun in the forest. She takes off her quiver of arrows, lays down her bow, and lies on the soft grass, staring up at the trees above her. Jupiter sees his opportunity. There she is, without a care in the world, her guard down. This is his time. So he thinks to himself, and for real, this is paraphrased from exactly what's in Ovid, he thinks... Now is the one affair my wife won't find out about. Or, I mean, even if she does, it's totally worth it for this nymph. She looks like she's worth a fit or two of anger from Juno. Guys, I just don't know how to properly explain to you how gross and creepy Zeus can be. At the same time, he's Zeus and he's the king of the gods and who everyone thinks about when they think about Greek mythology and it's hard to not love him. And still so hard to love him. Anyway, Zeus and I have a very confusing relationship. But enough about me and Zeus. 
After Jupiter points out how it's totally worth it to cheat on his wife for the hundredth time if it means he can fuck this random woman he spotted two seconds ago and decided because she didn't dress super girly she was a conquest he must complete, he... Ugh, you guys. Jupiter transforms himself. Jupiter transforms himself into... Diana. Jupiter transforms himself into his own daughter, Diana, the incredible badass goddess of the hunt who, again, has devoted her entire existence to never being with a man in any way and surrounding herself with amazing, like-minded females, which I think is pretty clear means what we all think it means, except the ancient Greeks who passed down these stories would never say it outright. Jupiter transforms himself into Diana, and he saunters up to Callisto as she lies comfortably on the forest floor. Oh, hey, virgin, he says. Yes, really, but it's not as weird as you think. They just talk like that back then. Oh, hey, virgin, where have you been hunting? Callisto jumps up, startled, but so happy to see Diana. Hi, Diana, she says, though less casually. Welcome, goddess, you who I love more than Jupiter, and I don't care if he hears it. Ovid is a storyteller, you guys, a true storyteller. Like, sure, I'm paraphrasing and making it, you know, very live, but this is what it says. Jupiter smiles, happy to hear that his disguise is working and that he's made the right decision in disguising himself. Creep. He smiles, and then he kisses her. Jupiter, as Diana, kisses Callisto, and she, and I'm going to use these pronouns because Callisto believes her to be Diana, and for the moment that's what matters, she kisses Callisto passionately, not hesitantly or gently as one of Ovid's time might expect from a virgin such as Diana. She kisses her, and Callisto doesn't try to stop her. Of course, it's not explicit here again, because it wouldn't be. But it seems clear enough to me that Callisto and Diana have some kind of relationship. Be it a mutual crush that neither acts on, or something more. Either way, when Diana kisses her, Callisto doesn't stop her. Until. Jupiter takes it to the next awful level, and he transforms himself back into himself just as he begins assaulting Callisto. Then, when she realizes it isn't Diana who's embracing her, it's Jupiter, a man, she fights. She fights hard, as hard as any woman could, Ovid says. And then Ovid has a brief aside, one that makes me tell you yet again how amazing both he and this translation of him are. He directs this aside at Juno, Hera, wife of Zeus, Oh, Juno, if you'd seen Callisto now, fighting as hard as she is, quote, you'd think of her in kinder terms. Callisto fights as hard as she can, but still, she's fighting against Jupiter, and there's no winning that fight. Once he's done what he came there to do, Jupiter leaves Callisto, returning to Mount Olympus, very proud of himself. Callisto, meanwhile, is broken. She's one of the few characters who reacts as many people, real people, would in this situation. She's traumatized, truly. She finds herself now disgusted by the forest she once loved so dearly. She hates the trees for witnessing what happened to her. She hates everything around her. But then... Diana approaches with the rest of her nymph entourage. First, Callisto tries to hide. She doesn't want to face Diana, and for a moment she fears it's Jupiter returning to her in the form again. But finally, Diana catches up to her, and Callisto can't avoid her any longer. But she can barely look at Diana. She knows the guilt is evident in her eyes. Callisto literally has PTSD, and it's fucking tragic. She can't look at Diana, can't sit at her side. As the chief nymph she once was, she can't go back to the life she had only a day ago. When I chose this myth, I didn't realize it would be so fucking depressing, and now looking back, I have no idea how I couldn't have realized it would be. Ovid says that Diana couldn't tell her what had happened to Callisto, couldn't see the signs. He attributes this to her virginity, but maybe she was just being naive or was herself in love with Callisto, as we might believe Callisto was with her. Either way, eventually it all becomes clear. Nine months later, Diana and her nymphs, Callisto included, seek some relief from the hot sun. There's a brook nearby, and Diana and her nymphs decide to take a swim. 
Only Callisto is hesitant. She doesn't want to remove her clothes around the women. But the other nymphs push her, and eventually they remove her clothes for her. And the results of Jupiter's horrific treatment are revealed. As I've said before, Jupiter doesn't ever leave a woman without proof of what he's done. He has some fucking insane, godly sperm. Callisto is pregnant, and now her secret is out. And Diana... Well, Diana, too, was raised in this dark world where women are at fault for what men do to them, and though she was able to escape some of the tragedies of being a woman in mythology, this desire to blame isn't one of them. Diana banishes Callisto for what Jupiter did to her, preventing her from ever returning to Diana's entourage of nymphs. But the tragedy that is Callisto's fate isn't over. Fucking Jupiter, honestly, does he have to ruin every woman's life? Could he not just stop? Callisto has been banished from her friends and her beloved Diana. She's pregnant with Jupiter's baby, and in time, she gives birth to the child. A boy. She names him Arcus. And as soon as Arcus is born, there's another shitty goddess ready to punish Callisto for something she didn't want anything to do with in the first place. Junor decides to punish Callisto for giving birth to proof of what Jupiter did, and she'll do it by removing what makes Callisto special, what made her desirable to Jupiter in the first place, her looks. Juno comes upon Callisto and grabs her by the hair. She pulls her down to the ground as Callisto pleads for pity from the goddess. But as she pleads, her arms begin to sprout thick, shaggy black hairs. Her hands lengthen and transform into claws, Her beautiful face turns into strong jaws, and her ability to speak is taken away. Instead, she can only growl and moan. Callisto has become a bear, but she's a bear still with the mind of the nymph. She wanders the forest she once hunted in with Diana as a bear, but a bear with the mind of a nymph and so terrified of other bears and afraid of the dogs that chase her and now she's hunted herself. One day, she encounters a young man hunting in the forest. It's Arcus, and Callisto recognizes her son. He, though, sees only a bear coming towards him, and he prepares to shoot the bear with an arrow. Jupiter sees this from his place in the sky, and he stops Arcus before he can shoot. Instead, he places the mother and son in the sky as the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, Great Bear and Little Bear. Our next story, too, comes from Ovid, but this time we're going back to the Trojan War with another favorite character of Mythological Pride Month, Achilles. Achilles has just encountered a man, Cycnus, whose body could not be pierced by any weapon. I'll tell his story one day, but today he's mentioned because his story causes the Greeks, during the Trojan War, to discuss another story. After Achilles fought this man, the Greeks sit around the fire at night, discussing what they'd seen that day. What they'd seen reminds Nestor of a much older story, the story of an incredible warrior from even longer ago than the Trojan War. Canis of Thessaly, Nestor tells the Greeks assembled. His body showed no wounds, even though he'd been hit by a thousand blows. Canis lived on Mount Othrys. He was courageous and famous for his skills and feats in war, a true warrior, powerful and brave and strong, a hero. He was a hero who was born a woman. Canis was the most beautiful girl in all of Thessaly, so beautiful she was famous for it. Canis was so beautiful that of course every man for miles around was trying to marry her. They all traveled to her town in Thessaly to try to convince her to pick them. But Canis wasn't interested. She wasn't interested in marriage at all. One day, Canis was wandering the seashore, minding her own fucking business, when, guess what? Fucking Neptune, Poseidon, came upon her. Do you know how few stories don't involve gods raping women? Because it's honestly getting a bit ridiculous. 
Neptune spots Canis walking along the shore, and surprise, fucking surprise, he immediately determines that he absolutely must fuck her, and that there's just no alternative to his having sex with this woman, regardless of how she feels about it, because he is Neptune, it is his right, he is god of the sea, and horses. When Neptune finishes assaulting Canis, he tells her that in return for, you know, being raped, she can have whatever she wants in the world. Weird, but what the fuck ever. Canis answers Neptune by pointing out that what she's just gone through is fucking outrageous, so she must choose something that will prevent her from ever suffering like this again. And again, let me tell you that when I picked this one, I didn't realize it would be so depressing, and you guys, I'm starting to think that most myths just were depressing, especially because most of them involve rape, and these ones happen to involve rape that is actually treated as horrifically as it really is. Canis... Canis decides that she wishes to not be a woman anymore, and that this would prevent her from suffering in the same way again, which is dark and fucked up. But Neptune grants her wish, and before she's even finished speaking, her voice is deeper and she has indeed become a man. Neptune explains that he's also gifted Canis, now Canus, they sound the same, one has an I, one has a U, with a body that is unable to be pierced by any weapon. Ovid makes a point of changing pronouns now, finishing by telling us that Canis went on to great success as an incredible and brave warrior known throughout Thessaly. And if Ovid can change the pronouns, so can everyone else. And so we have yet another story of a trans person in ancient mythology. I like to think that stories like this and that of Iphis and Ianthe were told to explain trans people in everyday life in ancient Greece and Rome. These people existed, and the ancients wanted a way of understanding what makes them different. What better way to explain something that is at times hard to grasp when you're not a trans person yourself than it being a gift from a god, as is the case in both this story and that of Iphis and Ianthe. A gift from a god. Maybe use that the next time you encountered a shitty transphobe or a bullshit turf out in the wild. Also, let's just note that even in ancient Greek mythology, people of the LGBTQ community face threats of sexual assault. I can't confidently say it's a higher rate than women because, let's be honest, there's just so much of it in mythology. But it certainly was an issue and it is now, too. Well, friends, thank you, as usual, for listening. I say it every time, but I want you to know that I'm truly so thankful every time, which is why I say it. I'm Canadian, after all. That we're polite is a stereotype for a reason. But don't get me wrong, we have some awful impolite shitheads, too. I'm just not one of them. Anyway, I hope you're all enjoying this series for Pride Month. It's been really fun finding these stories. Granted, few are particularly outright queer stories, but in the world we live in now, it's pretty clear what was actually going on back then, so I'm just going to say it. And I think it's important that we talk about it that way. In the story of Callisto, I believe it's clear she felt something for Artemis, whether it was a deep love that she understood or an attraction that she didn't. It doesn't matter. It's a story of a woman wanting another woman, even if it does end with a man fucking it all up. And Canis... The background is dark, but still, you have an example of another trans person in mythology, and I think that alone is important. Anyway, these ones were a bummer, but I'm glad I told them. Hopefully I can find a happier story for next week, but I'm getting the sense that doesn't exist. We'll see. I do just want to address one thing I've heard recently. Fairly unrelated. I honestly don't remember how it came to me, of it, or whether or not I engaged with it, but whatever, I'm telling you about it now. So someone contacted me to criticize the way I described the stories being passed down and taking on that patriarchal worldview that left women, well, the way they're treated in mythology. Honestly, I've forgotten the main details or whether or not this person was being rude, because you really never know with the stuff I get. But the essential point was that I'm wrong in saying that a reason for these stories being so harsh on the women characters is because the stories were passed down by men who emphasized the good of the male characters and the bad of the women. The argument being that in this ancient society where stories were passed down, not in writing, but in storytelling, there would be primarily women passing down these stories to their children, etc. Now, I'm not saying I know the history on this, because I don't. But with my knowledge of the general historical landscape, that's only partially true. Sure, women would pass down stories, but the world of ancient Greece was one with bards, that type of guy. Bards everywhere. 
Bards who tell stories to people seated around them, and those people then share the stories. These bards were always dudes. And by that, I mean, like, professional people who went around telling stories to, like, groups, right? I mean, they didn't have TV. They didn't have phones, obviously. So it was people who memorized these stories, and they would share it to groups of other people. So it was a profession, and therefore, sadly, in this time, it was men. So in the formal sense, it is always men passing on these stories. And while I'm sure there were stories passed down by women... Even if that's the case, even if they were all passed down by women, these women were still subjected to a wildly troubling patriarchal society, one that taught them that they were not permitted freedom, that they were the property of their fathers and husbands, a world where women didn't work or make decisions. So those women, if they did pass down all the stories, they were entirely based on the world they lived in. So the stories would still end up with a bent towards men and against women, because I say again, the patriarchy. Anyway, I hope that made sense. I was just thinking about it again and realizing I had an argument against that theory. And obviously, I'm going to share that argument because I'm an argumentative person. All to say, the shitty messages I receive are completely and utterly dwarfed by all the wonderful messages of love and encouragement. You're all so completely amazing, and I love reading every single thing you send me. So I say again, I can't respond to everything I get, but my god, I definitely read it and smile on the bus to and from work. You're the best. Thank you. I'm Liv, and I love this shit. <laughs>